We are recording. Uh, good morning, Ms. Williams. Can you please start us off with a roll call? Good morning, Commissioners. District 1. <laughs> District 2. District 4. <laughs> District 5. Oh, District 3. District 6. Present. District 7. District 8. Present. District 9. District 9 is present. District 10. District 11. District 12. District 13. Present. District 14. Here. District 15. Absent. We do have a quorum. Thank you very much, Ms. Williams. Good morning, commissioners. Today is Thursday, October 6, 2022, 9.26 a.m. Uh, my apologies for starting a little bit late. Uh, commissioners, before we get started, uh, Vice Chair Rubin is absent today, and Commissioner Young has graciously accepted to serve as Vice Chair today. Can I have a motion for that? Second. Thank you for your motion, uh, Commissioner Kingston, Commissioner Blair for your second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, motion passes. And uh, commissioners, before we get started, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Gracie. Good morning, sir. W welcome to the team. We're very glad to have you on board. And I, I think you'll, you'll find uh, serving on the commission both uh, gratifying and, and uh, uh, very challenging. Uh, fortunately, we have a helping group, so please feel free to reach out to any one of us uh, to help you ramp up the learning curve, sir. Thank you, sir. I absolutely will. Thank you, sir. Uh, commissioners, we'll just dive right into the dock and we'll begin with the Hensley Field uh, Master Plan briefing. We'll just be a briefing today, not a voting item, uh, and then we'll take questions after the briefing. Uh, good morning, S Mr. Castillo. Good morning, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, Arturo Del Castillo, Chief Planner with the City's Planning and Urban Design Department. Um, and we're here uh, today um, also with um, Don Rains, our Assistant Project Manager, and our Director, Julie Ryan. We're happy to be in front of you this morning after a two-year planning and design process to brief the Dallas, uh, to brief the, the Hensley Field Master Plan. This plan was previously brought to the Comprehensive Land Use Plan Committee and advanced to CPC on August 23rd of this year. The site is a former Dallas Naval Air Station, 738 acres uh, in District 3, owned by the City of Dallas and adjacent to Mountain Creek Lake. And it represents a unique and important opportunity to address many of the city's priorities, which we'll highlight here shortly. And to do so, I wanna hand it off to Jim Adams of McCann Adams Studio, our planning consultant, to begin the briefing. Jim. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Um, again, my name is Jim Adams. Uh, joining me today, um, and I assume you guys can see my screen. Uh, we can. Great. Right. Joining me today is uh, uh, Leah Hales and Sarah Fitzgerald from SWA, Landscape Architects, who are supporting McCann Adams Studio in in um, developing this master plan. Also, uh, part of our team, John Salmon of Terracon, will be here to talk about some of the environmental uh, issues related to the site. But as, um, as Arturo noted, uh, this is a 738-acre site located in West Dallas, really adjacent to and uh, surrounded on three sides by the city of Grand Prairie, located on Mountain Creek Lake. Uh, a pretty great site um, within the Metroplex. It's kind of in the in the center of the Metroplex, pretty well served by the transportation infrastructure uh, located just south of I-30 um, and along Jefferson Street. Oops. 
the site has some really great historic features. It has it served for over 50 years as the Naval Air Station, Dallas Naval Air Station. The site, as uh, Arturo pointed out, is owned by the city of Dallas. It was leased for many years by the U.S. Navy, uh, which uh, discontinued operation in the early 1990s. Um, but just some of the historic artifacts on the site, uh, the gate, which you see Hensley Field is no longer there, uh, but some of the other elements, including the uh, magazine bunkers, uh, really large uh, Navy hangar, uh, and of course, Mountain Creek Lake itself, which really are great features for, um, for this property. But from the very beginning, the city of Dallas uh, set out the mission for this project, which was to leverage the value of this real estate to create a plan that could be implemented, but that could achieve broader community objectives related to social equity, economic vitality, and environmental stewardship, really the, the three pillars of sustainability. Um, and through this planning process, six guiding principles were developed for the plan uh, that you can see here on the screen. Um, and each of these principles had a whole series of goals uh, that are intended to measure the uh, performance of the project, not only of the plan, but as the project proceeds over time. So environmental health, economic opportunity investment, affordability and diversity, healthy communities, mobility and access, history and culture. Um, as uh, Arturo mentioned, this has been a two year planning process. Uh, it has involved a pretty extensive public outreach process uh, in spite of the fact that it occurred virtually throughout the pandemic. Uh, we had a stakeholder advisory group comprised of uh, stakeholders and representatives of uh, surrounding properties, surrounding neighborhoods, um, and uh, special interest groups, as well as a technical advisory group represented by senior staff from the city of Dallas, as well as the city of Grand Prairie. Um, DART, the um, North Central Texas COG, uh, and others as well. So the, the process has uh, involved also uh, several community-wide meetings, uh, town hall meetings that were done virtually, as well as an on-site discovery tour in June of 2021, uh, where, which involved, which allowed folks to actually tour the site. Um, Several public surveys have been done as well. The master plan is on the uh, website, henslyfield.com, uh, and uh, it, which includes a video that summarizes the, uh, the opportunity here at, at Hensley Field. So to give you a quick overview of the, the plan itself and what is in it, um, the goal is to create a walkable mixed use community. The program could result in 3.7 million square feet of commercial and institutional uses and up to 6,800 residential units. Uh, a key goal for the housing is to provide a diversity of housing choices in a mixed income community that promotes long-term affordability and racial and socioeconomic equity. Uh, a Interconnected network of open spaces. The goal has been to uh, set aside at least 25% of the site, about 180 acres, uh, in publicly accessible open space. Uh, Leah and Sarah will be here to describe what that looks like. Uh, really maximizing the amenity of, of Mountain Creek Lake and the view, views across to the escarpment, uh, creating trails, marina. A water or, and other water oriented recreational uses, maximizing the uh, historic uh, uh, identity of the site by preserving some of the key buildings and facilities and reusing them on the site. We'll talk a little bit about that. Ensuring that the site is connected to the transport regional transportation system, including Dallas's uh, the DART high capacity transit network. And then very importantly, uh, in line with the um, climate action plan, promoting net zero construction and maximizing renewable energy sources. 
So in terms of the land use and economic development goals, uh, th these are five of, of those goals, but preserving at least 60 to 80 acres of land along Jefferson Street to attract one or more corporate or institutional users. The city has been reaching out to uh, healthcare providers, educational institutions to gauge their interest. Also, uh, the film industry is very interested in this site as well. And uh, that is one of the possible anchor uses that could be in that uh, 60 to 80 acres. In terms of housing, um, the goal is to target about a third of the homes at Hensley Field to be low to medium density fee simple ownership. And as part of that, to ensure long term housing affordability that promotes racial and socioeconomic equity, we're going to describe that program in a moment. Um, and then to accelerate the relocation of the Texas Army National Guard, which is located in the southwest corner of the site. Uh, they still operate um, uh, helicopter service for National Guard out of that corner, out the corner of the site. They are in the process of relocating that facility to Fort Worth, uh, and uh, we are recommending that that uh, be facilitated through the city of Dallas and the COG. And then uh, this is just a diagram that shows some of the ideas about that uh, economic development district. One of the key goals of the plan that we heard from our stakeholder groups is to attract a full service grocery store. Uh, to the site, uh, we're recommending this location along Jefferson Street that can serve not only the new community at Hensley Field, but also the surrounding uh, area, some of which is considered a food desert. Uh, and you can see the in the pink and the blue opportunities for a major uh, institution or corporate user uh, and an opportunity in the pink for a potential film studio. So. In terms of housing, uh, the goal has really been to provide a complete spectrum of housing choices that can be attractive to uh, empty nesters, young singles, uh, families, uh, a whole range of folks. Uh, as I said, the plan is showing a yield of about 6,800 homes, 30% uh, of which would be single family in townhouses and detached homes. 70% of those in apartments and condominiums. Uh, the plan calls for a mix of both for rent and for sale, such that not neither one will be more than 60% of the other type of tenure. So a mix of, of renters and buyers, uh, so that the it creates a, a place where people have a real sense of ownership and uh, a real mixed income community. So, uh, we have been receiving um, some input on our housing policies, and this slide represents where we current, what we are currently rec recommending in terms of affordability and inclusivity. Uh, so the goal being that uh, Hensley Field will be an inclusive community of socially and economically diverse residents, a mixed use and mixed income community. 20% of all of the homes will be priced for individuals or families earning 80% of adjusted median income um, and for ownership, and then for rental, 60% of AMI. In addition to that 20%, we're also recommending that 10% of the homes be targeted to folks earning between 81 and 120% of AMI. And that's really to uh, make sure that we don't end up with a gap in terms of affordability, that we have a complete spectrum of affordability on the site. Uh, there are a whole series of strategies that are being developed for long-term affordability. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, ideas of builder cross subsidies that a master developer would impose on future builders uh, to include a component of affordable housing, whether it's rental or for sales. The idea of community land trusts, which would be operated by a nonprofit, uh, rental housing agreements, low income housing tax credits. Um, we have here today also uh, Francie Ferguson from the Miller Foundation at, in Austin has been helping us develop uh, some of the strategies for long term affordability. Uh, I, I mentioned a nonprofit stewardship entity uh, should be established to administer the affordable housing program. Uh, and that 
sufficient startup capitalization and reserves be uh, incorporated into the plan for long term operations. Uh, and that includes creating affirmative marketing plans uh, that are focused on education, wealth building and financial assistance to make sure that uh, the, the outreach is achieved to those who could really take advantage of the affordable program really again promoting uh, racial and socioeconomic um, participation in this housing program. And then finally, a, a key selection for uh, criteria for the master developer partner that the city of Dallas will will uh, partner with on the project uh, should be direct experience and commitment to the implementation of the affordable housing program. So we can answer any questions after that uh, on the housing program. Um, I'm going to have Leah Hales uh, talk a little bit about the open space program for Hensley Field. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Jim mentioned, you know, part of the strategy for open space and facilities is to reserve at least 25% of the site or 185 acres um, for publicly accessible open space. This is going to be a combination of uses. There will be both passive and active recreation, um, some preserve area around Cottonwood Creek and the existing uh, channel there, and then some reforestation of um, the buffer edge against the uh, Dallas Global Industrials, things like that. So, and we are also even planning some um, urban agriculture for this area as well. So there's this, a combination of the different types of uses of these um, accessible open spaces. In the center of the site, we've reserved a, a 10 acre area for GPISD school with an associated additional 10 acres of play fields that would be shared community uses both with the school and with um, the general public as well and the residents of Hensley Field. Uh, we are have been discussing with the environmental quality, the city and others about reconnecting Cottonwood Creek. So the path there is the original uh, flow of the creek before it was cut off in the 40s for the extension of the runway. And we believe that reestablishing this connection is really key to overall water quality um, within the, the lake itself and within Cottonwood Bay. Uh, some of these areas you can see in blue, they're not exactly wet areas, but the idea of them is for them to be performative landscapes so that these areas will capture and clean stormwater within a publicly accessible um, park-like area. So they're kind of linear park systems, but they may have this blue green infrastructure within them where the plants are actually cleaning water, um, capturing stormwater, suspending uh, solids, things like that before any runoff happens into the lake or back into the storm system. And of course, with the Trust for Public Lands um, a concept of the 10 minute walk to the park, we would like to ensure a five minute walk to a publicly accessible open space for any resident or employee within the Hensley Field area. And of course, up on the northern section of the site, renegotiate with the US Air Force to on its lease boundaries. And I think they would be completely open to that to allow us to have that other pond and uh, green space at the front door to Hensley Field there. So this is just a rendering showing what that might start to look like, that reconnection of Cottonwood Creek. Um, this would give us some additional waterfront to put some commercial uses on, um, some park-like uses on as well, and create these uh, floating wetland systems within there that starts to help clean the, cleanse, cleanse the water as well as it, as it migrates through. And this would be against the marina, our proposed marina site, um, kind of an urban waterfront esplanade that would have some mixed use retail associated with it as well. Um, we think this is kind of a key feature for the city of Dallas that they may not have currently. Next. So one of the things in regards to transportation mobility is really maximize connections to the surrounding roadway network. So we're looking at three signalized intersections along Jefferson Street. Uh, I think two signals exist currently, and so we would be adding a third one. They're about a thousand feet apart. Um, then we would have some two additional ride-in, ride-outs along um, Jefferson as well. 
We've also discussed with the city of Grand Prairie and their transportation department connections to both Hardy Road, connections out of Lake Crest, a Skyline Road connection, all connecting to Southeast 14th, which is another kind of um, not a major road, but a collector street uh, within the city of Grand Prairie and having those connections out through the site. And then within the site, you know, this, this section perspective here showing how we would have this multimodal spine um, within the street system, as well as protected bike lanes um, and low speed devices, plus walkway spaces, all, you know, separated um, and protected so that we have this multimodal spine um, throughout Hensley Field. And we also had many discussions with DART on high capacity transit into Hensley Field. Um, currently, the, the uh, most productive thinking has been for uh, BRT, for bus rapid transit, connecting to the Jefferson Street um, DART line as it exists today, which is one of the highest used um, DART uh, for BRT. So we talked with them about that. There is future exploration to uh, light rail transit out into this area that, of course, would be a long term um, looking at future build outs with them. Having a ensuring residents are with 10 minute walk of transit um, and, of course, our network of low speed mobility and complete street design that um, is a high level of comfort pedestrians and, and bicyclists. Next. You're in control. There we go. <laughs> so, um, so this is just a roadway perspective kind of showing what where the BRT might be running there and having, um, you know, connections for everyone into getting, you know, within 10 minute walk of, of a BRT station. Another, you know, really fascinating part of this site is the historic um, aspect of it. You know, we've got these historic officer housing that we would love to see repurposed, um, preserved, and reused for a public amenity. Uh, of course, in the Dallas Naval Air Hangar, which is, you know, it's in a very great state of disrepair, but it's it's a beautiful structure. And if any of you have been out there and have gotten to walk up to it and see it, it's, it's really a fascinating piece. I don't know if many of you have known that there is a cemetery on site. And so, you know, working with um, the Historic Preservation Office to develop strategies and how to get people back to the site um, and then how we might reuse the smaller magazines and other features, key features within the site. Um, that really do tell a story about the history of this place and about the settlements that happened before the Navy was there and um, other things. It's a really fascinating piece of Dallas's history. And this is a concept rendering showing what that Dallas Naval Air Station may become. You know, it could be a place for a beer garden or kind of a civic space, um, community event center things like that. It, it's a really fascinating place. So we feel like really encapsulating it and, you know, putting some gardens around it and kind of having it as a, a public space where people can gather. It, it can be a really fascinating uh, location. It also has great access to the water on the other side of it. So, you know, there's so many opportunities there for that space. And then, of course, sustainability. You know, we would love to see Hensley Field become the living laboratory of resilience and a proof of concept for the CCAP. You know, Dallas worked really hard on the CCAP plan, and it's, um, we would love to see it implemented here and achieve the minimum of gold certification for lead cities and communities within this uh, site itself. Uh, we've got to um, ideas to establish the net zero requirements for low carbon healthy materials for all new construction. Um, we will show you an image in a minute of the runway village, the innovation village on the runway that just it would really be a demonstration project of a test of her state of the art green infrastructure, emerging building technologies, everything that we hear and we talk about, but we haven't seen implemented. And this is a really great way to showcase it how it works, how we can, um, you know, reduce carbon and 
um, do so many things that will really help our environment, you know, sustain it, have better energy and all of those types of things um, and reusable resources. We're also proposing recycling and composting throughout the Hensley Field to align with the City of Dallas's zero waste goal. Um, and then, of course, um, using ESG criteria for the basis to select one or more corporate and institutional anchor uses. So here it is showing that innovation village along the runway peninsula out into the water. You know, this could be a really attractive um, space for both people to live and to work and for companies to come in and really demonstrate, you know, kind of advanced new technologies uh, within sustainability. Thanks, Leah. Uh, John Salmon from Terracon is going to describe some of the efforts that have been going on regarding environmental remediation of the site and what's left to be completed. Thanks, Jim. Um, relative to uh, contaminants of concern uh, that were uh, initially uh, discovered at the site, uh, the remediation of metals, petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, uh, semi-volatile organic compounds and chlorinated solvents has taken place with uh, solar remediation complete. And uh, that has been approved by the TCEQ. Uh, there is still groundwater remediation ongoing, and it's been partially completed by the Navy. And uh, as I noted, there's still some ongoing. Um, relative to polyfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS, um, the Navy has just completed its uh, draft uh, final remedial investigation report that documents the result of the investigation of PFAS. Uh, that notes the extent of PFAS across the site and also included a risk assessment uh, of PFAS, uh, and that was just completed in June uh, of this year. Uh, they will be then now, their next step is to be working on a feasibility, a study, a feasibility a study to assess uh, remedial alternatives for PFAS, which is expected to be completed by the end of next year. And uh, the Navy has uh, committed to uh, completing cl cleanup of PFAS impacted soils prior to redevelopment or in phases with construction and coordinated with TCEQ. So if in some cases, um, if there's a phase of construction that's going to start first, they may, they're going to go and address that first and then go in and address other areas of PFAS. Um, and the Navy has agreed to complete uh, clean up to residential standards uh, for that PFAS. So um, with that, I will pass it back to Jim. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, this is going to be a project that's going to take at least 20 years to complete. A 700 acre project of this kind uh, has to be done, obviously, in stages. So we have simulated what that might look like. That's uh, in order for us to come up with the financial plan. Um, and this diagram here shows one scenario of how uh, the phases might work. And this is based on market studies, um, as well as our understanding of the site and um, what John just mentioned, the environmental cleanup aspects. So the first phase, first five years, uh, could result in about a thousand residential units, mostly concentrated uh, against Mountain Creek Lake. We think that this is an incredible uh, place to initiate a neighborhood um, that we think would be extremely attractive to a broad range of um, residents, and including uh, this would be an opportunity to kick off the affordable housing program that I mentioned. So 20% of those homes. Uh, would be um, part of that affordable program uh, and the additional 10% as well. And then in purple showing where we think the um, non-residential uses might uh, commence uh, against Jefferson Street, the large scale um, institutional uses, possibly the film complex um, yet to be determined, but the, the, this shows what Portions of the site could be opened up for that. And then the black line showing what infrastructure could be put in place to serve those developments, the roadway infrastructure. And then uh, you can see in the next two phases, phase two would go, uh, we would initiate the, um, I should have mentioned, initiate the um, reconstruction or realignment of Cottonwood Creek in phase one that would be completed in phase two. 
uh, there'd be additional 1600 units of housing that would be located now in the south southern portion of the site, including across the diversion channel uh, from um, into uh, Grand against Grand Prairie. Um, we would begin the runway peninsula village uh, innovation village uh, and some of the center uh, mixed use uh, development as well. Um, and then the third phase, the re the remainder of the houses, this is in a 10 year time frame, about 3,800 housing units uh, and the rest of the commercial program. Um, that uh, gives you a very quick snapshot of the plan. There's a lot more information that we can share with you with your questions. This slide is just showing uh, next steps. Uh, we are clearly briefing you today on the, the plan, but we will be in November going to uh, having a public hearing with you with uh, the City Plan Commission, uh, briefing the Environmental and Economic Development Committee. Uh, that's now scheduled for November 7th. We're also trying to schedule a City Council bus tour that should occur in November as well. Um, and uh, with the plan going for a city council vote, possibly in December. Beyond this year, um, you can see over the next three, uh, three years, 23 through 25, uh, we would initiate a developer selection process to select the master developer partner. Um, the, once that partner is selected, there would be a whole negotiation process to uh, agree on a master development agreement. Um, we would be coordinating cleanup with the Navy, as John described, uh, preparing the rezoning of the site, and then by 2025, hopefully initiating development. And that, that uh, basically sums it up. We'd love to uh, hear any questions that you might have and uh, really excited that we are at this point in the process. Thank you very much, Mr. Adams. Thank you for the briefing for you, to you and the team. Questions, Commissioners? Commissioner Stanner. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, what a great presentation. Very exciting for the city. Uh, naturally, I'm going to bring up the one thing that uh, I'm concerned about, uh, which has to do with your first thing is about environmental health. And the commissioners received a letter today from District 13's environmental commissioner, uh, Charlie Dankard, and he brought up the aspects, and it concerns me as well, that although I understand you are working with the Navy to mitigate what the leftover, even since the 90s, and not just PFAs, but other contaminants, that because when you've been operating a naval base there, you know, you've got lots of toxins that come about. And I guess my concern is, and Charlie pointed this out in his letter, is if you don't make sure that the whole 738 acres are fairly clean of contaminants in working with the Navy, how do you have the assurance that as you go down through 20 years and you start looking at it before each development and checking the soil then, how do you have the assurance that the Navy is going to come back and they are going to pay because actually the Department of Defense should pay for this mitigation? You know, when someone leaves a gas station or someone leaves a Air Force base, they have to uh, do whatever it takes to clean it up. So that's one of my questions. And the second one, uh, which dovetails with it, is when you are talking about reconnecting with Cottonwood Creek and you're using a marina at Mountain Lake and you're talking about making everything environmentally and carbon neutral, and yet you're, not, you're going to start without being able to assure the buyers or the renters that this area is clean of contaminants. How do you justify that? Thank you. So I'm going to have... Uh... John Salman kind of begin to respond to that. And uh, I believe Lori uh, Trulson is also on the line as well with the city's environmental um, office of environmental quality. Thanks, Jim. Um, to, to 
start out. So we've been involved with this project for quite some time now, working with the Navy on cleanup of the site. Um, during that time frame, a, a tremendous amount of cleanup has already been conducted. Uh, there is some that still needs to occur. Um, it is not uncommon when you look at large properties of this nature, particularly old um, uh, military bases, that you will see a development occur in a phased approach similar to what Jim has proposed is proposing here that will take a fair amount of time and cleanup will go through in those phases and because it is 738 acres. It's a large property to go in and address all of that cleanup before you can start anything is going to take a long time. There's, you have to encumber the funds for that cleanup, um, things of that nature. And yes, the military still has to encumber funds for it. And it would take a very, very long time before you could ever start development. If you didn't start with that phased approach, if you do it in phases, you can actually get it developed as you go. Um, Navy has committed to doing that, uh, that work. Uh, we are, um, you know, certainly from the standpoint of um, some assurances, I think one of the things that we would, we had talked about with EPA in the past is um, what they call a ready for reuse letter. Um, and so what we would do is designate work on portions of the site and have those ready for reuse and get a designation that says, yes, it meets the standards for residential development and the development can, can, can occur. Um, and I think that that starts to give some assurance that we've got the oversight of TCEQ and EPA to look at this and say, yes, it is ready for reuse. They concur. They agree. Um, it meets the residential standard and you can develop it residentially. Um, there's actually a, a fair amount of the site that would that would begin to meet that relatively quickly. Um, it's just a matter of going in and having that assurance. And I think it's hard to understand that. You know, I've been involved with this project for, you know, I think it's about 16 years now. So I have all of the background knowledge that that a lot of folks don't have. They're looking at it and thinking, oh, my gosh, this is all bad. And I've seen it from a di very different perspective in terms of how much has actually already been done and also some that still needs to be done. But that, you know, so you see it from different perspectives, depending on, you know, where you come into to, uh, the process. And so I think getting that ready for reuse makes a big difference because it gives you that assurance that you it is ready to go in and be developed in that way. And you've got a sign off from both TCEQ and EPA saying they agree. Um, so and I think from, from that side, so hopefully that addresses some of, some of the- Yeah, yes, questions. you, you may did. Have more I, that I appreciate, I appreciate yeah. your detailed answer. I guess lastly, I do want the confirmation though, I, my only concern, and you explain what you explained, that on each parcel you're developing, you wouldn't develop until you had the ready for ye reuse letter from the EPA, which I appreciate. The other aspect, though, is let's just say that the last 50 acres of this weren't going to be developed until 15 years from now. I just want to know that you have a contract or written understanding or some sort of agreement with the Navy that they're going to be equally responsible 15 years from now coming in and making sure they mitigated as they were when this was initiated. And I think relative to that, um, and and I think what the, the assurance we have is that um, back in the early 2000s, the city actually brought suit against the Department of Defense. And there was a, a settlement agreement that was uh, made between the city and the Navy, and the Navy agreed to clean the site to residential standards. Um, and so within that settlement agreement, there is that agreement to do so. So I think there is something written in place now in terms of maybe, you know, time frames, maybe we need to get something different in place that says, no, we will meet that. We will address this in, in a specific time frame. Uh, but there is something on paper that says they have agreed to that uh, to, to clean up to that standard. Thank you. I would be interested in the time frame, only that it would be terrible for the city that if 15 years from now you went on your last parcel and we didn't have the funds to be able to do that and the time had already expired. Thank you so much Correct. for all your information. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Gracie.
Thank you. Uh, again, great presentation. Uh, living very close to that, I'm super excited about that. Uh, and to follow along with my colleague's uh, questions, uh, and she really kind of asked the question I was really going in terms of the timeline. The, the, I understand, you know, from a cost perspective, it makes sense to do it in a phrased approach, but uh, is there a way to get that assurance from the Navy that that cleanup timeline aligns with your phased approach at the very least? And then the other question I have is, uh, and forgive me because I'm new to this, but I also want to be able to see, you, you mentioned that some cleanup has already happened, and is there a place where I can find to see what has already taken place in terms of environmental cleanup? So, um, to, to address the um, the second question, and uh, Lori, you can correct me if I'm if I'm mistaken on this. Is there information on the HensleyField.com uh, site that uh, relative to the environmental cleanup that's been conducted and where? Yes, I think that is on there. Yeah, I, I, so I think you may be able to um, access that, and it would give you some information as to where that is. If not, we can certainly provide additional information around that. Um, did you want to address, Lori, the, the conversations you've been having with Navy? Uh, I was just going to state that um, the city is having ongoing communication with the Navy um, to get more commitments with um, cleaning up the site. Uh, that would meet the uh, redevelopment schedule. So it's conversation ongoing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Blair. I like this um, more of a, a marina type of feel. It takes me home. But my question is, it um, the need for housing for sale opposed to housing for rent. You have a high, you have a higher percentage of for rent than for ownership. Can you explain to me the my, the thought process behind that? Uh, yeah, <clears throat> actually, that's really not the case. What we're saying is we don't yet know exactly what the balance is going to be between for rent and for sale. That will be determined uh, by the market and as the project proceeds. But what we are suggesting is that in no case will there be more than 60% of the housing as for rent or for sale. So the balance will always be between 40 and 60 or 60 and 40. Um, and again, it's just because we think that's the right kind of proportions and we didn't want to exactly hardwire the exact number. So, uh, that's kind of the, the way we're setting it up right now. May I continue? Uh, you, okay. So you're saying that 40, 60, 60, 40 for rent for sale and, and your projection today is a higher number for rent than it is for sale and in the economic development understanding that we have home ownership is supposed to be the priority why can't that be more of a 40 percent for rent 60 percent for home owner ownership opposed to the opposite uh well, we could certainly make that change in the plan if uh, if you all feel that that's important. I, again, we haven't made that assumption in the plan. It is the plan as it currently exists could support 60% ownership. Uh, it would mean that there would be a proportion of that would be in condominiums and uh, multifamily ownership. Uh, but. Uh, Right now, we have, we haven't made a specific commitment one way or the other. It's just that balance between 40 and 60. But again, if that's felt to be important, we could we could make that change. I appreciate that, and then and I understand that you are also appreciating the fact that 
in the southern area of the city. We don't have the housing stock of condominiums, and this is a great opportunity for that to, to occur. Um, and it's a great opportunity for upscale, high-end housing in a condominium type of environment that's sitting right on a marina. Um, it, it would stand, and, and I need to help. I need help understanding, or help you understand that um, that is a great opportunity for upscale growth. If you are going to put in higher density, higher um, un, uh, units of of a higher number of floors that are for rent not, excuse me, not for rent, but for sale, I would like to understand or like for you to understand that that would be a better opportunity and a better mindset than a more for rent at a lower income bracket. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Anders. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to start saying that I think this is an excellent presentation. Um, you guys have covered a, a lot of the concerns that, that I've had or expressed. I think that it's forward leaning. It puts a good light on this area of Dallas. Um, it shines opportunity for this area of Dallas and it reflects the uh, comprehensive thought patterns I think that the staff have taken on on presenting this information um, a couple questions um, are there opportunities I'm looking for the educational alignment that would help serve a community that has this many residents um, is there any reference to how you plan to create um, those educational alignments yeah thank you um, I think one of the things we've been working with Grand Prairie Independent School District, uh, who are would have this jurisdiction on the site, even though this is in the city of Dallas, it's the GPISD boundaries. And so they are um, pretty assured that they would need a school within this site. And so they don't know yet exactly whether that would be an elementary school, a middle school, high uh, probably not a high school uh, or whether it would be some special kind of magnet school. So what we've done in the plan is set aside 10 acres uh, for uh, GPISD plus an additional 10 acres of uh, play fields that would be shared by the broader community. So for the one thing is we have set aside really 20 acres for uh, some kind of school at the very center of the uh, development. In addition to that, we we have uh, been in conversations with various uh, universities and schools about the possible interest of using a portion of the site for their facilities. Uh, Dallas College, as an example, has uh, expressed interest in this development. We have no commitments of any kind right now, but uh, the acreage that we're setting aside along Jefferson Street, 80 acres, uh, could be really suitable for an educational institution of some kind. Thank you. Um, second question, is there any attitude towards short-term rentals at this location? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have not really dived into that uh, issue. I suspect that this area would be subject to the same policies of the larger city of Dallas. Um, but there may we have be not, we've yeah, there may be opportunity to follow that conversation and, and try to have some kind of reaction to it in, in, in that lane. Um, so in terms of urban design, um, are, is there a plan to create guidelines that begin to influence sidewalk widths and and self-shading uh, heat island mitigation um, and those kinds of approaches oh yes thank you for asking that question so in the plan itself uh, we have very specific standards for how all the streets would be designed uh, and, and then the plan also requires a certain percentage and Leah remind me I think it's uh, a, for canopy um, 
to mitigate heat island. It's 40% for the Texas Trees Foundation. Yeah, and so we are planting a lot of tree planting here on all, along all streets uh, at the curb to shade sidewalks, uh, as well as uh, Leah mentioned forestation, reforestation of the site. So a lot of trees, 40% to create a 40% canopy over the site. Okay, um, and I'll just make these last two. I've, I've seen some of the sustainable elements and I appreciate those. I'm wondering if you could layer in smart city initiatives that began to collect data and all that kind of stuff so that we could use those as a city. Is there any um, reference to air taxis and drones for new kinds of deliveries and things? And also special populations like teachers or seniors and things like that. Um, and that is the end of my comments and questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you. Well, to answer your question about um, drones and uh, air taxis, we really have not addressed that, but we have uh, policies related to innovative forms of transportation and uh, like automated vehicles uh, and the ability for this plan to evolve uh, with those new Commissioner Kingston. Thank you. Um, so I echo everyone's sentiment about this being potentially a fantastic redevelopment of this part of the city. Um, and I share the concerns of some of my coworkers or colleagues about environmental concerns and the need to specifically incorporate things like senior housing. Um, and I, I question whether we're doing enough density in the MF2 sector. Um, I think that there's room to do more density and uh, I also want to take this time to plug uh, including more stoops and small front porches into some of the designs because I think those are community building. Um, I have some specific questions. Is it your idea that you're only going to have one development partner um, on this project or do you intend to have multiple development partners depending on the type of um, product being developed? So that... Um that's a good question. Uh, that right now, based on our research and other projects of this scale, uh, finding one master developer partner, and by master developer, we're talking about the entity that would be responsible for building all of the infrastructure, roadways, utilities, um, parks, uh, and then also responsible for coordinating other vertical builders, and there could be many other uh, vertical developers uh, that are doing individual projects, uh, residential builders who are doing different uh, housing types within the neighborhoods. But that, that decision has not been uh, made yet by the city. That is a, a recommendation that we're making as part of this plan that, uh, that the city proceed to find a master developer partner there are uh, a number of... Pardon me, Mr. Adams, do you, is your camera on, sir? Uh, no, but I can put it on. Let me see. Second. Not used to WebEx. Okay. Um, there so, you are. Thank you. Everybody. Uh, so, yeah, the idea is to find a, a national level partner who could help the city implement the plan and then coordinate the vertical development of uh, other types of buildings. Uh, and very importantly, as part of that, manage the affordable housing pro uh, program. Uh, I think you mentioned uh, the need for senior housing, uh, lower income housing. That would all be part of that, that program. Um, I also want to uh, give a shout out to your point about stoops and front porches. What the urban design program for this project requires is that all development uh, have an orientation to streets. So if it's on single, the single family townhouses or detached homes, they would all have porches and stoops. 
if it's uh, when even in these multifamily projects, the ground floor would have townhouse units oriented to the street and or and or shop fronts. So uh, that very important in terms of creating that um, level. But to answer both of your questions at once, there. Thank you. I actually have a few more on that. Uh, is there any um, discussion about using uh, form based development, or do you have some other plan for how to uh, accommodate or achieve uh, good urban form? Well, I think that what we would be doing is basically form based code because uh, the design standards that would be put in place on this project would be form based because. Uh, there is, we, we are promoting a mix of uses. Uh, so the land use uh, program will be pretty um, flexible, uh, but the forms of the development will be very specific in terms of how buildings relate to each other, how they relate to the public realm of streets and parks. Uh, so yes, a form-based uh, approach would be, uh, would be applied. Okay, and then on, um, you have a variety of different types of affordable or workforce housing, which I think is very important, creating a place that everyone can live in. Um, one of the things you mentioned was rental housing agreements. Is that like a master lease agreement? Do any of those things exist in the city of Dallas right now? Uh, by rental, um, rental agreements, I think what we talked, what we meant by that is that when you have a master developer partner, they're going to be seeking uh, developers, vertical developers to build apartment buildings, for instance, rental apartment buildings. So as part of the agreement between that master developer and that rental developer would be an agreement that a certain portion of that uh, of those units would be part of the affordable program. Um, so that's. That's what we've seen in other projects uh, done uh, that has been very effective. Okay, I, I guess I sort of assume that. Is there any discussion about employing a master lease agreement? I'm not what sure city what is the, is the master lessor and the uh, essentially guaranteeing the lease payments at these levels so that landlords are incentivized to take vouchers? Um, I don't know that that, um, I mean, that might be done individually with individual projects, uh, but not for the entire 730 acres. Um, I, I'm not, I don't know if I can answer your question specifically, and I don't know if uh, anyone else is on the line who would, who would be able to answer that master, a master lease agreement. I think what we're talking about is a master development agreement uh, between the city and, and a master developer partner that would um, dictate the terms of how the land gets disposed. So there might be provisions in that master development agreement that would ensure that um, vouchers uh, would be accepted by um, by apartment developers in the future. Okay. Um, has anyone? I'm, I'm certain that this is the case, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Has anybody evaluated the potential flood? Ramifications and or flood control measures that would be required to reposition Cottonwood Creek. Um, we're not in a flood. Um, we, we have no floodplain on the site, uh, so we don't think that flooding is going to be an issue related to the realignment of Cottonwood Creek. Uh, there are other issues that uh, we need to explore. Um, you know. The idea, and we will be working closely with TCQ and uh, and uh, the Navy on cutting that channel through the site. But flooding is not really one of the issues that has come up. Well, has anybody evaluated whether that could be an issue when we reconfigure the location of Cottonwood Creek? I mean, has anybody thought about if we do X, Y result might include flooding, and how do we, you know, mitigate against that? We can certainly ask the question. It's never really come up because there have never been issues of flooding in this area. But um, 
we can certainly ask that question. Okay, I would appreciate if you put that on your list. Um, mm -hmm. Have you considered infrastructure for many vehicles? Has um, there been any it, discussion about the the potential use of many vehicles in this development? We've talked a lot about um, low speed devices. Uh, we're talking about scooters. Um, they could be tricycles, uh, that kind of thing. And we've established, I think Leah mentioned, uh, protected uh, pathways for those types of vehicles. So when you talk about mini vehicles, uh, are you just talking about small motor vehicles? Yeah, I mean, there's a sort of an emerging use of what they call mini vehicles in places, and you're even seeing it in Dallas. Things that are closer to the size of a golf cart or these motorized trikes, they're really not micro mobility, they're mini mobility. And, you know, one of the things that when we're developing, um, you know, lanes for traffic is where do these go and how do they get in implemented into our existing um, vehicular flows. Mm -hmm. And I, I just see that on the horizon and we're talking about building a project 20 years from now, that well may be something that needs to be thought of now as we're thinking about lane widths and traffic controls. Okay, that, um, you know, we'll give a little more um, look into that. We are, you know, anticipating over the next 20 years that there will be uh, innovations in terms of mobility technology that the plan will need to respond to. Um, I, you know, I think automated vehicles is probably the, the most uh, imminent one, uh, but we'll, we'll also look at the, um, the idea of mini vehicles uh, and lane widths. We are, if you look at the, uh, the uh, street sections that we have in our plan, we are adopting Dallas's own um, street standards, it's smart street standards. Uh, uh, and so uh, they are, the lane widths are as narrow as we can possibly get them um, within current standards. Um, let's see, I have a couple more questions if that's all right. Sure. Um, is there any plan to landmark any of the historic structures or features? Yeah, I mean, we have been working with the uh, city's Office of Historic Preservation. Um, the state has also said that the officer's housing in the, at the very front of the development, they uh, could be eligible for national landmark status. And then working with the city, there may be other elements. Um, Leah talked about the, uh, the Navy hangar. Um, there are other elements of the site that could be uh, have potential for landmark status, at least uh, local designation. Yeah, and I think part of that too is one is going in and stabilizing those um, existing facilities now. You know, there's roof issues on a couple of them that need to be repaired uh, before any future deterioration happens. But I do think there's the possibility to have um, the officers' housings be a landmark if they are taken care of and stabilized sooner than later. Um, okay, a couple other questions. Is the city's environmental commission also being briefed on these plans? Yeah, we are, uh, we have briefed them and we're planning another briefing, Arturo, I believe in November. Okay. And my last question for today, will there be any Calatrava bridges? <laughs> I hope so. I hope not. <laughs> oh, you hope not? Okay. Calatrava bridges. Maybe a Calatrava sidewalk? No? <laughs> It can be a Calatrava bridge just for the mini vehicles and the golf yeah. carts. Yes. Uh, Mr. Adams, just one quick question for you, sir. Uh, could you address maybe the ownership, ownership of Mountain Creek Lake? And are there any special considerations that uh, this body needs to take a look at in regards to that and adjacency? Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, the Mountain Creek Lake, as you probably all know, was uh, 
basically dammed in the 30s for uh, to create um, a cooling reservoir for uh, the power plant that is just across the lake from us that is owned by currently owned by a company called TexGen. We have been in and so TexGen actually owns the lake. Uh, we have been in conversations with TexGen. They have um, said that they are planning to decommission a power plant within the next five years. Their interest is in redeveloping their site, probably very much along the lines of what we're proposing here at Hensley Field. So there need to be, and the plan talks about this, there needs to be uh, conversations between the city of Dallas and TexGen about uh, the arrangements to be made in terms of use of the lake uh, for recreational purposes. Uh, we believe that uh, TexGen has similar interests in using the lake for recreational purposes. And, uh, and so those conversations need to proceed as part of the planning process, the development process. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think I understand this. I just want to be sure. We will be asked on November 3 to approve the master plan, but the zoning will follow some period of time uh, after that. Is that correct? Yes. So I think the way that we're recommending, we the plan says that. Uh, we believe that the correct zoning for this site will be PD, um, but what we're suggesting is that that zoning actually happen in tandem with the uh, negotiation of the development agreement with your master developer partner. Uh, that's how it's been done in other projects. So uh, the master plan that you're looking at today will provide the basis for that. Uh, and the basis for the negotiations with the master developer, but uh, and then the zoning will follow as, as part of it. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Commissioner Pocket. Um, I just wanted to clarify on the map real quick. Uh, where is the marina that was mentioned? Are you still seeing the screen? I think you are, right? Um, no. Oh, you're not. Let's see if I can share. So, if you look at this uh, rendering here, the the marina as it's proposed would be where at the mouth of the new uh, realigned Cottonwood Creek, um, and so in this kind of area that forms a natural basin uh, on the site. Okay, that's basically, great. Basically, basically this is south. such an exciting development. I just want to make sure I have the, the, the details all straight. Where um, was the historic officer house that you were talking about? It's right at the very front. I, can you see my cursor? Uh, it's mm. right on the front of Jefferson, right along Jefferson Street. Um, at the At the very front gate to Hensley Field uh, are the two officers' houses. Great. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, has there been any thought to um, any kind of independent solar? I, I know this isn't necessarily a city of Dallas policy, but I think there's a huge opportunity here to create some kind of, um, I don't know, microgrid or something. Would that, is that something that you guys have talked about? We've talked a lot about um, alternative energy. Uh, on the site and ways of achieving net zero. Um, and so that is one option that that we've talked about. Uh, certainly one of the, the policies that we're recommending is that all development uh, be required to incorporate photovoltaic uh, panels as part of their project. We're also looking at geothermal as a potential source for heating and cooling, which we think is uh, a viable option as well to reduce energy consumption. Um, and so between the use of uh, renewable energy, solar, uh, as well as geothermal, we believe that we can um, achieve uh, the climate action plan goals for net zero. 
That's fantastic. That was my next question. I heard there's existing geothermal already on the site. Is that true? There are, uh, I don't, that is, that's not quite true. But there are some wells that were, that are on the site that might be able to be reused for geothermal, but, um, we know of no existing geothermal facilities. Is that correct? <laughs> We had heard some discussion that there was some near the city, um, existing city facility buildings, um, kind of in the southeast quadrant of the site. Um, we went out there. No, it wasn't there, Jim. It was over where we kind of met before um, in that existing facility for the drive, the where we yeah. had the buses staged. Yeah. Um, we went and looked for those facilities out there with one of the engineers. We didn't see any evidence of it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just that it's probably a very small infrastructure if it does. I think we have a gentleman here that may yeah. have some insight. Jim, hi, this is Don Rains. Uh, we had met uh, a gentleman on one of the tours last uh, June last year and uh, had involvement with the geothermal work at the uh, public works building there. So I'm not sure how to the extent of that is, but apparently there is an existing. Oh, in the public works. Well, cool. thank you. Thank you. That is so intriguing to me. So um, is it, would, would it be true that we wouldn't need any changes in policy to utilize some geothermal on this site? This seems like a perfect site for it being coordinated all or developed all at once. I don't believe it would require a change in policy, but um, Don or Arturo may be better um, able to answer that. I, I don't believe as well, um, although we'll take a look at it. Um, we have some time and uh, we'll definitely, those are one of the things on our, on our to-do list um, for the next couple of years is as we're working through the agreement with the master developer. Fascinating. Thank you guys so much for this um, presentation today. Commissioners, any other questions? This is Commissioner Hawk. I have a couple of questions. Uh, yes, Commissioner Hawk. All right, so wonderful presentation as everyone has been saying, and some of these questions might be a little bit too far in advance, but I'm just curious about a couple of things. Um, this one, uh, how did you arrive at the division of how much residential, how much office, how much retail for this development? So it was based on a pretty comprehensive market study. Uh, that was one dimension, one lens that we looked at through it. Also related to community um, goals for the site. So we certainly wanted to create a mixed use live, work, play uh, kind of community here. So, um, and I, I should emphasize that when we say that it's 6,800 units of housing and 3.7 million square feet, of, that's an illustrative plan. The, the zoning that we put in place is going to be able to provide some flexibility. So we may end up with more density, as I think one of the commissioners suggested. Uh, I can give you an example of a project that we're working on here in Austin for the redevelopment of the former airport in Austin, the plan originally called for 4,500 units of housing. 20 years later, uh, the plan is gonna be delivering 7,700 units of housing. So uh, it's important that when we put the zoning together that we provide that level of flexibility, uh, certainly within criteria and formed base standards. So we end up with a development that is uh, still achieving the design principles of, of the plan. Thank you for that. And then for for the retail, let's just say someone mentioned, I think it was Leah during her presentation mentioned maybe having a beer garden there. Who would own, would you do a ground lease with the tenants or how does that work with that type of, with like if there's an entertainment facility there, who owns the dirt? How does that work and maybe you don't have an answer to that question, but I was just curious. That's, that's a good question. I think that um, basically what would happen in a situation like that is it could end up being any number of things. If it's located in a park, uh, it may end up being uh, owned by the city and mm -hmm. it may be a lease to a concessionaire. That would mm -hmm. be one scenario. Uh, it could end up being a private development entity and that development 
entity basically purchases the land. Um, so it could be any number of things, but there would be, uh, it would have to be coordinated certainly between the developer and the city to make sure it's consistent with the overall plan um, and the zoning. Uh, and um, yeah, but it could be, it could be any number of things right now. Great. And one last question um, that you mentioned uh, having an, you know, a large office tenant there right now in that area, you know, there's a lot of um, industrial down there. What are, what's the plan? And there may not be 1, because I know we're very early, but to attract an office tenant who would want to be in that area. It's a good question. I, I think 1 thing we heard from all of our stakeholders is that what they did not want here was more industrial use, right. more warehouse use, more industrial, because the the feeling is, is that this part of Southern Dallas is oversaturated with that type of use. Mm -hmm. So the goal here is to create office use. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that uh, providing this amount of real estate for a major office user will be attractive. We also think that providing the amenities and the housing and the other types of uses will also be a big attraction for uh, a corporate or institutional type of office use to the site. Uh, we've seen that in other projects. Um, again, I refer to the one in Austin, uh, which was able to attract a major hospital. And with that, a lot of medical office uses associated with the hospital. So, we believe that providing this venue, this mixed use venue uh, with the type of amenities and open spaces and this orientation to Mountain Creek Lake is going to make this very attractive to uh, an office user. Thank you for that. That's all I have. Appreciate it. Thank you. Commissioners, any further questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. Del Castillo, Mr. Ad. I had a question. Okay, uh, we have uh, Commissioner Carpenter. I have a question for staff, Mr. Del Castillo or Mr. Raines. I know at uh, Comprehensive Land Use Plan Committee, we asked if it had been possible or would be possible to arrange a bus tour of this particular site. Has that, you weren't, didn't have an answer at that point. Has it been arranged or decided? Uh, we're currently uh, working on trying to organize something similar to that. So we're working uh, with our preferred vendor, Cowtown Tours, uh, to see what dates and uh, availability they have. And once we have that, we'll circulate available dates and see who might be interested and available to, to participate. So we're targeting any anywhere from, um, well, the rest of this month and into um, November, but I know that this goes back on November 3rd, so that's something we're looking into. Thank you very much. I think it'd be very helpful. And you might bear in mind in that scheduling process that we have moved our October 20 meeting because there will not be a quorum of the commission available on that date. So that would probably not be an ideal date. Any further questions for the presenters or for staff? Well, thank you. We look forward to seeing this uh, on November 3. Look forward to the bus tour if that can be arranged. And that will conclude the briefing on this item. Uh, we'll proceed into our zoning consent agenda, starting with case number three, Mr. Pepe. Can you hear me now? Mr. Pepe, we're not hearing you. Now? Uh, hearing you faintly. Okay, I'll, I'll speak up um, 
and, and please let me know if you can't hear. Okay. First item is Z212134. And this is an amendment to the development standards within Plain Development District number 741, an expansion to the Plain Development District 741, and, oh, excuse me, sub area A to include an additional 446 acres of land currently zoned in A Agricultural District with specific use permit number three, and Plan Development District number 942, and three, adjustment of the boundaries of sub areas A, B, and C within Plan Development District 741, located in an area generally bounded by East Beltline Road to the north, Dallas City Limit to the east, Hackberry Road and Ranch Trail to the south, and South Beltline Road slash Dallas City Limit to the west. Area of request is 1,481 acres. And it is located at Cypress Waters, which is an exclave of the city uh, within District 6. So here is the site as it stands. This is North Lake. Um, most of what you're seeing is in the city limit. Um, what's highlighted is in the city limit and most of that is within the PD at this time. Um, that's North Lake as it's built out and the partially developed portion of the, of the development Cypress waters um, as well as the undeveloped portions. So the proposed conceptual plan kind of gets across uh, the point about the sub areas that are being proposed and the sub area adjustments that are being made. So you can uh, see that they are adjusting the sub area boundaries for B and C slightly by one to two acres uh, roughly and in the northwest and south of the property. A is the existing sub area A um, and A1 is the area to be added to, this, to sub area one uh, with the same zoning standards as sub area A. And so that includes North Lake as well as some acreage of land to the north of North, north Lake, which is located by the future Dark Silver Line Station. <clears throat> and to the north, uh, PD 942 is undeveloped. Uh, then to the east is outside city limit, to the south is outside city limit, to the west is outside city limit, city of Capel, and then the, the east side was um, city of Irving, and to the north is the Dart Silver Line station. Uh, that's PD 1039, and that's under development right now. But uh, the area to be added to the PD is zoned A agricultural and PD 942, and the rest of the area of request is within the PD at this time. So the current area of the PD is 1036 acres. It's originally approved in 2006 and sub subsequently amended two times. Currently, it uh, comprises approximately 85 acres of residential uses, 48 acres of office uses, three acres of retail uses, and 82 acres of parking uses and 34 institutional or public school uses. The remaining acreage is either undeveloped or agricultural uses. PD consists of four sub areas at this time. Sub area A, B, C, and D. Sub area A is the majority of the property as well as the privately developed portion of the property, including residential and office developments. Sub areas B, C, and D are currently used or planned as public schools. Um, PD uses MU3 as a base district and it has various alterations to the use, yard, lot and space, landscaping and parking regulations um, to, to MU3. And the applicant is requesting to amend the existing PD, uh, primarily the development standards of uh, sub area one and also requesting to add 400 acres to the north of the PD. And it also uh, amends the development standards themselves to change the conditions to 
uh, remove the requirement for development and landscape plans and instead requiring more precise design standards and modifying the tree preservation standards to reflect current tree mitigation totals. So I'll go through the site. These pictures are from January, um, but I've been in and out of the property ever since to, to confirm how things are going and looking. So here is the property from Beltline. And it's it's just a huge site. So if there's anything I can describe in more detail that is not pictured, please ask me and I will describe it for you. Um, this is so I focused on taking pictures of the area to be added um, to, to because that's the, the part being rezoned um, from one thing to another. So I focus on that. So this is up north in the area that's PD 942 right now. This is looking around that property. It is difficult to see, but I think this is the grounds of the former power plant that's now removed. Um, this is the north boundary of the property at Beltline. So this is area to be added to the PD near the start station that's under development. And then that is, I think, along the alignment where it's being added. Uh, so that's north, belt, north of the property on Beltline more of that moving down belt line towards where the construction's happening for the station. And then looking back, um, this is at Cypress Waters, the currently built out portion, looking north across North Lake at the area to be added, which part, part of which is North Lake and part of which is the uh, agricultural land to the north. So, based on the, de the development standards that are shown here, they're not modifying these basic development standards. Um, so, they're keeping these in place. Uh, I can highlight any of them as needed, uh, but these particular standards are not changing in regards to the, uh, how things are built out generally. However, they're amending the requirement for a development plan um, where, wherein they have to continually go through and submit development plans to the CPC and do minor amendments to them and other things like that. So they're requiring no development plan. And instead they propose a number of design standards um, to make a bit more predictable development than would under the current system. So first thing they've done, um, this is actually where we kind of started the process is they drew up a purpose statement. Um, and while purpose statements don't necessarily uh, reflect uh, the rules on the ground and they, they need development regulations to back them up. I think that this purpose statement does make it clear for anyone reading the PD, interpreting the PD later down the road, or future commissions or staff, it makes it clear what the intention was. So there's no debating um, about what the intention was behind <laughs> this change and the, uh, the PD going forward. So we do have this purpose statement, um, which generally is to use Traditional neighborhood development, um, enhanced walkability, enhanced transit use and trail use. However, those are followed up with uh, actual development standards um, and I can highlight them really quick, um, but generally they would limit fencing to four foot in front yards. Um, they added facade transparency, they enhanced their transparency standards. Um, they require individual entrances that are visible from the street for buildings. Um, and they added individual entries for multifamily, 60% of ground floor units have to have those. Uh, structured parking concealment methods, um, either, well, a combination of screening, combination of uh, material, of quality materials that the building's made out of. Uh, those are gonna be required now. So there's a combination of methods there and block per perimeter and pedestrian connectivity. Uh, this is a tool from Article 13 uh, that says blocks larger than 2,000 feet in perimeter have to have a pedestrian um, passage through them. So this either mitigates the, uh, the detractions of having a large perimeter site uh, by having uh, a passageway through, or it just uh, you know discourages larger blocks overall um, by, by uh, putting a cap on, on where you want your size. And then calls for sidewalks of minimum six feet um, at a minimum, uh, but it does allow for several of the street exhibits that exist um, throughout 
or in the PD uh, call for larger widths. Um, it also adds limited driveway cuts, widths, and distance requirements for single family driveways and duplex driveways. Um, surface parking is, would be prohibited between the facade and property line on two facades of, of a property. And if a property has more than two facades, um, it would require additional landscaping and parkways um, and buffering for the sidewalk um, in, on those facades. And then open space. Sites larger than two acres must contain at least one uh, larger continu contiguous open space um, accessible to public right away. Uh, it's not their only open space requirement, but that is uh, one that is a way to ensure that we have at least one large contiguous space on those larger sites. So either it discourages larger site, uh, larger blocks, or it uh, provides those contiguous open spaces, which are. Uh, human scale, and then it states that loading areas and backup house functions must be located away from primary streets, limited in width and screen. That's also an Article 10 provision. And lastly, the tree mitigation uh, did, it was determined uh, through their submission and, and verification with Harbor's office that tree mitigation, as originally called for in sub area A was completed. Um, they replanted uh, more than the required amount of trees um, throughout the existing development as it's built out. And so mitigation has been completed essentially for that area. Um, so they're they're reverting to Article 10 for that, um, that portion. And then we're also applying new tree mitigation through Article 10 to the new area to be added. So that get, kind of goes through the tree mitigation process again instead of just being lumped in with the old um, tree mitigation, which was completed. So with that, uh, staff recommends approval subject to conditions. Any Commissioners, questions? questions for staff? Commissioner Stannard. I have a question statement. This is one of the best working PDs I have ever seen between Mr. Pepe, Commissioner Carpenter, and obviously their applicant was involved. That if we're taking away, wouldn't you agree, Mr. Pepe, that if we are taking away submitting development plans, the best way to do that is that as Commissioner Carpenter has done, you load up the PD with specifics for the future. That's yes, your question. I, I, I would I would agree with that statement. That was um, exactly our line of of thinking in evaluating this and and working through and adding design standards. Um, we 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 hoped to make design standards that create something predictable enough. If you if you read these standards you can kind of get an idea of what it's going to look like or what it could look like um, just through the text alone. And that's that's what we were aiming for. So thank you. Job well done. Thank you. Other questions for staff and commissioners online. I can't see you. So if you have a question, speak up. I have a couple of questions. Uh, am I correct that the applicant or applicants collectively own the entire area of request? They do collectively own the entire area of request, uh, except for sub areas. I, I don't believe they own B, C, and D, but we have their authorization um, as well, because those are COPEL ISD. Okay, so the entirety of the PD as expanded is either owned by an applicant or has the the application has the consent of the owner. That's correct. Okay. My other question is about the exemption of areas other than sub area A1 from the tree mitigation requirements. Am I correct that that is an artifact of the unusual conditions in the original PD that instead of requiring tree mitigation per Article 10, uh, specific 
quantities of mitigation were prescribed for the various sub areas and now those have been fulfilled. That's that's correct. So it originally just called for 19,988 caliper inches of mitigation and 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 then they ultimately completed that uh, as of the January uh, submittal it demonstrated 21,000 caliper inches of mitigation. So they they did complete what the mitigation that was called for originally. So even though you might say that going forward, the areas other than A1 uh, are exempt from mitigation requirements, that is in fact the status quo even before this amendment because the fixed quantities of mitigation uh, have already been achieved. Yes, and, and I wouldn't even say they are exempt because I would say it's been completed, exactly. Okay, but but right now, if it's not a if if we adopt this, well, and and right now, if I want to cut down a protected tree and it's not in area A one, I can do it, and I don't have to mitigate. At this time, that's that's my understanding. Yes. All right, and the exception okay. would be if the tree was already counted as a mitigation tree, then it is a replacement tree and it is subject to further tree mitigation if it's removed. Yes, that's my understanding as well. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on this item? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Pepe. Uh, we're going to, Commissioner, skip over case number four and go to case number five. And welcome back, Ms. Munoz. Hi, good morning, everyone. Okay, you should be able to see my presentation now. Yes, we can see it. Fantastic. And this is an application for a specific use permit for the sale of alcoholic beverages in conjunction with a general merchandise or food store, 3,500 square feet or less. The property is currently zoned ACR community retail district with a D1 liquor control overlay. The applicant is requesting this so that they can have the sale of alcoholic beverages for off-premise consumption. And they have an existing store there on the site that's called Carnitas La Primera Meat Market. Here's the location of that site. It's on the north side of Lake June Road, west of North Prairie Creek Road in the Pleasant Grove neighborhood. And an arrow map showing the developed site and you can see the surrounding land uses there. Um, we do have single family located to the north. We have an auto related and personal service uses to the west. To the adjacent to the east, we do have a single family use. And then beyond that, it's a regional retail district with retail and other auto related uses. And then across Lake June, we have retail uses followed by an R75 district where there's additional single family uses. So this was this site was originally granted an SUP for the same use back in 2015. And then additionally, it was renewed in February of 2017 for a five year period with automatic renewals for additional five year periods. However, they did miss the window and they failed to submit before the SUP expired in February of 2022. So they were sent a notice to advise them that their SUP had been terminated and therefore the sale of alcoholic beverages was no longer permitted. So they immediately submitted a new application for an SUP, which is why you're seeing a request for a new SUP rather than for a renewal. The site was developed back in 2011. It has a 2,476 square foot structure and then a CO was subsequently issued for the general merchandise or food store 
including the sale of alcoholic beverages in November of 2016. They are current right now with their Chapter 12B convenience store licensing as well. So here we are looking onto the site from late June and that's the meat market and that you can see their sign is posted um, right on the roadway for people to see. And now we are looking further from across the street and the interior of the site as well. Now we'll take a look at the surrounding land uses. We're looking eastward on Lake June and south of the site. That's how we're looking onto that street across Lake June. You see the retail uses that are across the street. And then here is the site plan that's proposed. It was the last approved site plan for the site. And north is up. It shows that existing 2,400 square foot structure. It's one story. And the parking all fronting along Lake June Road. This is just a close-up of that configuration for you to see. And the proposed SUP conditions, which permit the use and the time frame of a five and five period as well, since this use had previously operated and just missed the window for renewals. Staff is recommending a consistent time frame of what was previously approved. So it would be approval for that five and five period subject to the site planning conditions once again. Commissioners, any questions for staff? I have one, and you knew that either Commissioner Blair or I was going to ask this, but is the applicant currently selling alcoholic beverages at the site? They did advise me that they are still selling alcoholic beverages at the site, yes. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yes, Commissioner Blair. Are there any cold involvement at this particular site? Code, excuse me? Has code been, been apprised that they are operating without a SUP and selling alcohol? So they were immediately issued the letter stating that their SUP was terminated and that they should stop the sale of alcohol and then submitted their application. So typically when there's a pending application, I don't believe that code compliance pursues any action, but I can double check with code compliance and see if they have anything pending at this time. Could you please before our hearing? Usually um, whenever code compliance reaches out to us, they kind of have things on pause until after they see action from CPC. Thank you. Any further questions? Commissioner Standard. Uh, yes, you may have already said this and I missed it, but when did they put in their application for a new SUP since they didn't meet their February deadline? Just one second while I go back to that slide. So here, this is also a part of page two of the case report, and it just states here the history of the SUP. And obviously this is for a new SUP, but yes, they did have the old SUP issued in 2015. It expired, the renewal of it expired on February the 22nd of 2022, of which we then mailed them, the operator, a letter on March 14th explaining that they, the use was terminated now and that they would have to either submit an application for a new SUP or stop the sale of alcohol, of which then they did submit the, the new application. So I do see here that I think I left off that one sentence that states the date of the application, but I can pull that up right now. Further question? No, so you said, I couldn't understand the last of it. You said you didn't have the date of the application after we you do. sent the March 14th? We do, it's, it's on the report it's on, on the first page. Yes, on the first page of the report, on the right-hand side, it states the date of application submittal but I didn't include it there on the paragraph, so I apologize for that. 
and that is March 23rd. Oh, okay, that's what I couldn't hear. Okay, March 23rd. Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing and hearing none, thank you, Ms. Munoz. We'll move to case number six, Mr. Pepe. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. This is Z212231. This is an application for a WR3 walkable urban residential on property zoned in IR, Industrial Research District, southeast line of Kimsey Drive, northeast of Maple Avenue. Uh, uh, it's northeast of the of Maple Avenue, the intersection of Kimsey and Maple Avenue, and the area request is 7,500 acres. It's located here in District 2. So that property as it exists right now and the street as it's partially built out. So to the northeast is property zone WR3. That's currently under development. And to the southeast is IR land that's undeveloped. To the southwest, there is property that's IR and is developed as multifamily. And to the northwest, there's MF2 and multifamily. And there are townhomes farther, excuse me, farther to the southwest. <clears throat> the area of request is currently zoned in IR Industrial Research District and is currently undeveloped. The applicant proposes to redevelop the site with multifamily under the standards of a WR3 walkable urban residential district from Article 13. The applicant plans to develop five units of multifamily on a single lot. And there has been a trend of lots within the vicinity being rezoned away from industrial zoning to allow multifamily uses. Most recently, the adjacent lots, which are WR3 walkable residential. The proposed zoning allows the applicant to develop the desired multifamily use but uh, calls for an improved street presence and urban form under Article 13. That's the property as it exists right now. And that is, that is the surrounding use of multifamily. That is across the Kimsey uh, multifamily as well, and more multifamily to the north um, across Kimsey. And then those are some of the remaining homes uh, to the northeast, but this was earlier in the year, and I, I don't believe they are there anymore. Um, so comparison uh, table, just just for, for our understanding, um, but generally uh, WR3 is going to be a less intense district than the IR that's on the ground there right now, um, and it does come with those added benefits uh, to the city uh, and walkability of transparency, a primary entrance requirement, blank wall uh, maximum, and uh, the it has increased density and, and lot coverage and a higher height. So those are generally things that, that would help with the walkability in the area. Um, and I did include because of the proximity and, and context, uh, the MF2, which doesn't have those uh, urban design standards um, and is slightly less intense district by, by some uh, calculation. So staff recommendation is approval of WR walkable urban residential. Um, I will state that the applicant has stated they wish to amend the request to MF2, um, but I'll let them handle that at the podium, but I just wanted to give you the heads up. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, questions for staff. So, uh, Mr. Pepe, if the applicant is requesting MF2 and the staff is recommending WR3, does that suggest that the case will need to be removed from the consent agenda? In Yes, if, if, if they okay. intend to do that, they, they did state they intend to do that. So in, in that case, I believe it should be off of consent. All right, any, any questions for staff? 
I want to commend you for your analysis of what I call the critical mass provisions of Article 13. For a long time, staff kind of overlooked those, and I think they're very important, and I'm very glad to see that you uh, conducted an analysis of that. Um, that said, I want to ask this question. Uh, you reference the vision illustration in your staff report. Are you aware that the comprehensive plan says that the vision illustration is not to be used to determine individual zoning issues? No, I, I wouldn't say that it, that it is um, determining a single uh, a zoning case, but it is actually more of a trend of, of zoning that we're we're um, supporting on this block under this zoning. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's it's only an individual case um, as it's supported recommendation on the neighboring lot, uh, which was approved, um, and it it shapes the the view overall for the area. So I I, I don't think it's individual. It's it's only an individual um, decision. Well, are you aware of the legend that indicates that it does not indicate official city policy relating to specific sites or areas? Yes. All right. Thank you. Any further questions? Yes. Uh, yes, Commissioner Popkin. Um, how, if the applicant has changed their request, um, does that change staff's recommendation? Uh, no, it does not. We still recommend uh, the walkable residential and believe it can um, accommodate their project goals um, just as just as easily through the uh, through the walkable residential. So it, it will remain uh, WR three. Could you um, provide maybe at the public hearing some of the changes, some of the differences between um, the WR three? request and the MF2 request? Yeah, and, and most yes. of that is, is going to be found here. Um, I can be, highlight anything in particular. Um, WR3 requires um, a minimum frontage. Of course, that is that does include an exemption for the 30-foot driveway, so they should be covered if they want to have a singular driveway on the property that, you know, accesses from the side. Um, it does have a parking setback, and that says parking parking uh, uses might may not be 30 foot from the front property line, um, but that in in effect um, moves you know the habitable uses towards the street. Um, so on one hand, they have to set their parking back a little farther, but they can put their building up closer, closer at five between five and 15 feet, um, and so that. Is we see it as a, as a benefit of the WR3 because you have that habitable use close to the street rather than an unactivated parking use. Um, and that's that's the point of Article 13 is to activate the street better. Um, so that's a um, significant change. But uh, we still believe that the added height, the added um, the sh smaller setbacks and the added lot coverage um, as well as reduced parking, make it easier um, for them to develop the, the site under the multifamily use and still accomplish our goals. Um, but is there anything I can highlight on this table? Um, that helps clarify my question. And so just to clarify further what you just said, um, so you're saying you believe, or staff believes that WR3 can accommodate their goals under, that they would anticipate <laughs> Um, accomplishing under MF2? Yes, it, it, the, the WR3 has, again, reduced setbacks and higher density and, and massing and height. Um, and it, it should help them accomplish their goals because they're, they're originally were shooting for five multifamily units. Um, certainly will have the space under this still. Under the density? Um, line on the table you're showing? Yes. Um, why is MF2, why, did, why is it so prescriptive about the size of different bedroom 
types? So, yeah, those are those are not the size of the unit types, but those are the lot area that's required to have each unit type. So, though it's it's kind of a backwards density. Um, that's just how the code is written, but it it's a it's backwards to a density. So, if you have seventy five hundred square feet of of lot, you can you you and then you take your unit type and you divide it by that. So. If they have 7,500 square feet of lot, uh, we see that the 1,200 of 1,200 square foot of lot is required per two bedroom. You divide that, and that's how you get your units allowable. Um, for example, but this is this is how most MF uh, densities actually are, are calculated. This is really fascinating to me. So essentially, under the WR3 they would be able to build an efficiency smaller than 800 square foot, so something more akin to a micro unit. And it would also give them the flexibility to build, well, I guess like a two bedroom, that's a minimum of 1,200 square foot of lot area for each two bedroom. So really the WR gives them a lot more flexibility, it looks like. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will. Apologize if I wasn't clear, but I mean that doesn't that doesn't have a bearing on the size of the unit itself, but the rather the amount of those types of units that we can have. But yes, they, you would have the ability to develop more units under WR three um, within the bounds of the other the setbacks and other things. Um, but yeah. Okay, and one last question. So quickly to clar clarify this new Article 13 that we're still wrapping our brains around. Um, the difference between WR3 and WMU3 is that this is walkable residential only and the other would be walkable mixed use. Is that correct? Yes, generally. So the WR3 is, is almost only residential uses. I believe it also has office use in there, but walkable residential is um, more of a it usually should have more of a dense uh, multifamily build out rather than like than shops or things like that or 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 shops with uh, apartments on top that that's not typical of the of the wr3 the wmu is more of the the vertical mixed use that you're talking about okay interesting thank you so much for that deep dive other questions commissioner standard uh, yes, I just, uh, Mr. Pepe, if you could just clarify one thing for me. Because under the WR3, it's 3.5 stories and a 50 foot max. And I understood they were asking for five units. But they then want the MF2, which gives them 200 feet and 15 stories on a 7,500 square foot lot. Uh, Obviously, no one is envisioning on a 7,500 square foot lot that kind of height, but am I correct on that? You might be looking at the left. The left column is the existing industrial. The, the left column is the existing So what would they get under MF2? 36. 36? Yes. And this one they get 50. Oh, okay. I saw that. I read that incorrectly. I thought that okay. was comparing the MF2. Oh, well, then uh, Commissioner Popkin's right. This seems to give them more flexibility. Great. Thanks. Commissioner Popkin. One additional question along those lines. I know our MIH program would allow an MF property by right to have additional height if they're providing affordable units. Is that allowed in WR3? I don't know the answer to that one yet. Um, thanks, thanks for asking that. I can look into that. Uh, I don't know the answer to that um, yet. Uh, I know it. Yes, it will, but uh, I think okay. we're still figuring out because in Article 13, the affordable units are, in order to get the bonuses, there are some weird provisions into that. So let, let me circle with Pam and I'll get back. Other questions? Commissioner Blair. I have a couple of questions. Two, can you provide us with that this chart you have showing that gives us the difference? Because it's a nifty little chart that I would love to be able to read. I can't read it where it, where it is now. Okay. It's in um, the report generally. 
It doesn't okay. have the it doesn't have the difference between I looked at your case report. It didn't I didn't seem to find it with the difference between WR three and MF two. It had the IR and the WR three, but it didn't include the MF two. You're correct. I can I can certainly provide yes, that for you. You know, share your share the knowledge. You know, we we want to all see. Um, then number my second question in the case report page six you know uh, it shows that the, in the land use your land use chart it shows that in the southwest area it's zoned ir but the land use is single family and we're looking to develop um a multi-family, whether it's WR3 or the MF2, and then you, it's, when I looked at the map, I'm going down, down, down to the maps section, it shows that, yeah, on 615, that on Kimsey Drive, this is in the middle of the block, and if we're having single family, is this going to be next to a single family or is, are we looking to put in whether WR3, MF2, in the middle of a block that is going to have a different front face than the other property that's either across the street or even next to it? Could you, um... So it, it is adjacent to a property that is industrial and is single family right now. Um, there's one home that is, is under that um, or would fall into that category as we just described. Um, and that is the one to the Southwest. Um, so what, what question can I answer in regards to that? Uh, Mike, so my next question is what is the, how will this development impact RPS? RPS um, does. If this is adjacent to single family, will the RPS be impacted with, uh, with the adjacency of a multifamily? And then the next question would also be, if we're going from WR3 to MF2, what is the height that they're looking for in MF2? And does that, again, um, impact the RPS for the single family that's already in place? The, so RPS, um, RPS is generated by zoning districts, right? So the IR that, the IR that covers the property, the single family property, the one um, doesn't generate the RPS. RPS um, is in effect for article 13, like WR3 or MF2, either way, uh, but it's not gonna be generated by that single family property because it's under IR. So let me make sure I understand. We have a single family that is in a IR district, correct? Correct. It's non-conforming, correct? That's right. But it's still a single family, correct? Yes. yes. As, and, as, as of the last time I was there, it was a single family. I just to clarify. Is that a single family changes. occupied with residents? I, I can't con confirm that. I I'm not sure. It, it appears, when I visited, it appeared as a single family home, um, but there's been a lot of changes on this block, obviously. So I, I can't confirm if it's habitated right now. Okay, so we don't know whether they're, that single family, whether it's non-conforming or not, is actually occupied with residents, correct? I, d I don't know it, if it is. I will say, um, and 
you know, this is, um, excuse me, this is informal, but the applicant is attempting to purchase that property as well, just, and that might come up um, in their discussion potentially, but just putting it out there. Well, I, we can, I know I can ask the, the, the uh, applicant at the, the, at the hearing, uh, but my question for staff is consideration of the placement of multifamily next to residential, whether it's conforming or non-conforming, you have the propensity and, the, and I'm noticing the propensity and the tendency not to give consideration to single family that's already in place when you're putting a towering building right next to them. So am I to understand that moving forward that the consideration of the placement for single family and multifamily has changed from when I first came in and I was taught that was something we never did. So the, the property is currently IR and that um, could, you know, that is a district that includes RPS. The proposed WR includes RPS and the, um, the other the alternate MF2 includes RPS. That said, it's generated by districts, not uses. Um, so it, it's not Thank generated you. by that single family property. Uh, I have a question for the attorneys. Uh, the applicant is apparently going to be requesting MF2A. Does the notice of the case for WR3 permit consideration of MF2A? And if you need to defer your answer until the hearing, that's okay. No, we have an answer for you, Commissioner Young. Um, because the use is less intensive, the notice is sufficient. Okay, thank you. Whereas we have the opposite situation in the next case. That is correct. All right. Any further questions on this case number six? Yes, Commissioner Kingston. Thank you. Um, in evaluating this case and making a recommendation, did staff look at it through the lens of CCAP? If so, can you explain your analysis? If not, why not? If so, I would say that it, it, it aids in the CCAP goals um, in that it, it increases density, it increases walkability um, adjacent to transit. So that's that's certainly a, a route through which it, it um, approaches the CCAP goals only through the only through the tools that we have, which is land use, that is a way in which it, it um, moves towards CCAP, the increased density, increased walkability of our recommendation adjacent to transit. Any further questions? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Popkin. So just for clarity in terms of adjacent um, zoning to the northeast, those existing single family homes, which were under IR are now zoned WR3. It looks like that just went through council. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So okay. there, was, there, there, there are three lots um, on this map. They do appear to be single family undeveloped and single family, but they're under development in reality. These, this imagery is from a year plus ago, but they're under development as um, multifamily under WR3. Oops. Yes, and so what's indicated on your map as multifamily to the southwest is indicated on my agenda, page 6-17 is undeveloped, but that's underlying multifamily or underlying IR zoning? Um, sorry, it's hard to tell exactly what you're, what, um, so where the label on that slide says multifamily is under multifamily that's, it, it appears vacant on this, on this slide. Yes. But it's almost built out in reality as that yellow building. And so that current zoning is MF2? That one is MF2. 
um, but that that's a development that spans multiple lots too. Um, and then you can see the lot we uh, Commissioner Blair was talking about um, to the closer to frame here, but these pictures are from March, I think, or, or earlier in the year. Um, and it, frankly, it's a really rapidly changing block. So I, I, I don't know exactly where each of these properties stands, but that one that, that says um, multifamily on the, the land use slide is, is, is built out almost. Okay, so to the extent that there's any remaining single family homes in the area, they're either on IR zoned property or recently rezoned MF2 or WR3 property. Is that pretty much what we're seeing? That's correct. Thank you for that clarity. Any further questions on this item? Seeing and hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Pepe. We'll go now to case number seven, Mr. Mulkey. Good morning, commissioners. Um, before I get started on my case, there is a comparison between MF2A and WR3. So if you want to look at my case report, which is so much better than Mr. Pepe's. <laughs> I'm kidding, he did a great job. But you still aren't staying. Oh, no, I guess you may stay on consent if it's under advisement. <laughs> Okay, next case today is Z212-249. Get this out of the way. The request is, come on, an application for an MF2A multifamily district on property zoned an IR industrial research district. It's located on the southeast line of Kimsey Drive, northeast of Maple Avenue, and it's about 1.17 uh, acre. Location map showing the property within city limits. Uh, aerial map with the property outlined in blue. This is also on Kimsey Drive. Zoning map with surrounding districts and land uses. Uh, give me one second here. Okay, this is the outdated zoning map. Okay, um, to the northeast zoned an IR district are existing single family uses. Uh, to the southeast also zoned an IR district is undeveloped land as well as a vehicle display sales and service use. Uh, to the northwest across Kimsey Drive is multifamily zoned an MF2A. Um, this zoning map is outdated, but uh, immediately southwest, uh, these three lots right here uh, were just rezoned to a WR3 form district. And then the lot uh, directly southwest of that is Mr. Pepe's case that was just presented. Uh, the, case, the property is currently zoned in IR district and developed with single family. Uh, the applicant proposes to redevelop the site with multifamily under MF2A district standards. Although staff has no objection to the requested land use, uh, we recommend a WR3 form district due to the denser urban character of the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and this is quickly becoming sort of a boilerplate overview of form districts, but I'll go through it one more time just to add to today's discussion. Um, so form-based zoning differs from traditional Euclidean zoning uh, in that development standards focus primarily on the form of the building rather than its intended land use. Uh, the desired form of buildings is typically more urban in style under form-based zoning. Uh, it's characterized by multiple stories uh, with buildings located at the front of the site closer to the street. Um, this is combined with standards for street frontage requirements, transparency, building articulation, and pedestrian amenities that lead to a, a, a higher design outcome. Um, these uh, standards are intended to ensure an active streetscape that encourages pedestrian activity and screens parking. So usually the parking would not be located between the street and the front of the building. It would usually be located behind the building. Oops. 
Um, benefits to property owners under form districts, there are some additional entitlements, including additional buildable area, uh, increased standards for height, density, and floor area, some more, more saleable or leasable area can potentially go on the site. Uh, also reduced parking requirements um, that encourage the use of multimodal transportation. And uh, form districts are intended for neighborhoods with a dense urban character and high walkability, which we definitely feel this area meets that criteria. Um, so this is a sort of kind of good example of um, standards under traditional zoning. You see the front and side and rear um, setbacks um, that you know kind of lead to uh, a less dense site. So there's there's less coverage allowed on the site. Um, this is from Article 13 of our code um, that outlines uh, WR3 district standards. Um, so you can see rather than being um, set back pretty far from the public right of way, um, the buildings are encouraged to be up towards the street, um, you know, with a lot of enhanced pedestrian amenities along that street to lead to a better public realm. Um, and this is, this is also from Article 13, um, just kind of defining um, some of those facade standards and um, different heights for upper stories and ground stories and, and things of that nature. Uh, and then these are some photos that are just uh, meant as examples of what form district zoning can look like. So some site photos of this site. Uh, this is the lot in question. This is on Kimsey Drive looking southeast. Surrounding uses, uh, this is immediately northeast of the property. You can see some of those single family homes. And then we're just kind of moving in a counterclockwise fashion. This is the multifamily to the northwest that's owned MF2A. And then further down the street, looking at some of those MF2A lots. More views of that. Further uh, southwest of the side along Kimsey Drive. And this is Mr. Uh, Pepe's case that was just discussed. And then these are photos of my case from earlier this year, Z212175, which as I said, was just approved as a WR3 district. It's those three lots right here. And then these are um, <clears throat> some more detailed photos I included that kind of show from a design perspective what the outcome is under MF2A. Um, with these buildings, because they are such narrow lots, there's not a lot of engagement with the public realm. Um, you know, there are a few trees and, and some, some yards at the front of the site, um, but the buildings do not face towards the street. Um, they essentially face inward along a shared driveway. Um, you know, and, and you can see here that with uh, standards under MF2A um, on these lots, the outcome is, um, you know, most of the front yard is, is driveway. Um, so it's more of an auto-oriented outcome rather than a pedestrian-oriented outcome. And just kind of more views of what that looks like under MF2A. Um, so this is just some consideration of our, our recommendation in the surrounding area, so that we definitely see that there's an emerging dense urban character of the surrounding area. Um, it has um, proximity to the Inwood, Inwood Love Field Dart Station. Um, per uh, Commissioner Young comments earlier, the critical mass requirement is definitely met for this area. Um, there's also the Stimmons Corridor Southwestern Medical District Area Plan that's in effect. Uh, it designates this area as urban residential medium, um, which would definitely coincide with um, a WR3 district. Uh, it also designates this area as the DART Inwood Station Strategic Opportunity Area within that area plan. Um, there is also currently a trail um, to the southeast um, that by the end of this year, I'm told from parks, will extend to the Inwood, Inwood Love Field DART Station. Um, and this is not confirmed, but th there is the possibility of extending that trail further along the uh, right of way. So that trail might um, be very close um, to the end of Kimsey Drive. Um, so with that, staff's recommendation on this one is unfortunately hold under advisement to November 3rd, 2022. Um, we would need the opportunity to re-notice the case. Um, and with that, I'm available for any questions. Questions, commissioners? Commissioner Carpenter. Mr. Mulkey, do we know what the applicant's objections are to WR3? 
Is it lack of familiarity? I mean, these cases are going in opposite directions. That's why I'm. Yeah, un unfortunately, um, you know, with these being two different properties, two different cases, two different case planners, there's been. Um, uh, it's the same applicant. Same applicant. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's been some back and forth on, on the review of them. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the applicant. Um, okay. I, I, mean, I do think that um, some of the concerns with WR3 is it's less of a known entity. Um, you know, the uh, form district regulations are uh, sort of intentionally more complex than traditional zoning. Um, so there may be some hesitancy there. Um, which I'm optimistic we can um, continue discussions and allay some of those fears. Um, I'm not sure if Commissioner Hampton will be joining us today, but she mentioned in, in one of our conversations that um, she was willing to put the applicant in touch with some uh, staff and development services so they could kind of walk through um, what some of those things are and, and hopefully um, um, the applicant can see that there are actually some really definite benefits as the private developer um, for this kind of district, you get to put more on the on the property, you know. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I can say about yes, that. Yes, thank you. That was more or less what I expected. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Commissioner Standard. I, I, I must be confused. So what you're saying is there, and I understand because the city attorney addressed this, that you don't have to re-notice the one before because it's less instead of going more, so it doesn't have to. But they're okay with that one going forward, and yet this one's going to be held to put the... Right, so so with this one, with, with Mr. Pepe's case, it was noticed as a WR3, um, and after the notice, I believe leading up to this meeting, I, I can't speak for Mr. Pepe, but I believe the applicant stated that he would like to change his request to MF2. Um, so if that's what the commission voted to recommend approval of, there wouldn't be a need to re-notice because as you said, um, an MF2 standards would be less intense, less height, less lot coverage, et cetera. Uh, than a WR3. The opposite is true here. Um, I took over this case very quickly after the previous case planner uh, moved to a different team, and at that time on, on this application they were requesting an MF2. However, if the commission were to vote to recommend a WR3, they would be unable to do that without re-noticing because WR3 has higher height, higher lot coverage. I hope that kind of explains Yeah, things. that makes perfect sense. Okay. What you said, which doesn't make perfect sense, is I'm wondering why we're not holding both of them over. But I understood the difference. I, I got it. But it's kind of like we're dealing with the same owner and it's basically the same thing and why we're not holding the boat. Thank you. Sure. Well, we'll, we'll see how the hearing goes. <laughs> that might in fact happen. Uh, any further questions on this case? All right, thank you, Mr. Mulkey. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, proceed with the next case, which is number eight. Um, back to Ms. Munoz. Thank you very much. This next item is an application for a specific use permit for a bar, lounge, or tavern and an inside commercial amusement use limited to a live music venue. The property is within Tract A of PD number 269. That's a deep Elm near East Side Special Purpose District. And they would like to operate a bar, lounge, and or tavern and have live music within the property. Here's a location of that map. Of course, it is located in Deep Elm and it is east of Good Latimer Expressway. There's an aerial map showing the suite and the developed nature along Elm Street. And the surrounding land uses, we have additional bar, lounge, and tavern and commercial amusement uses to the north to the northeast, to the, to the east, and to the far west. Then we have some retail and personal services also um, to the northeast and to the west, and additional retail uses. So um, this property was originally developed in different phases, and it covers a portion of the block 
with multiple editions made from 1920, 1930, and 1970, and overall has a variety of retail and commercial uses with surface parking spaces all along Elm Street. And then in June 2006, um, the City Council amended the Deep Ellum PD to require SUPs for certain uses, including bar lounge or taverns and inside commercial amusement uses. So back in 2009, City Council did approve an SUP for this site, um, number 1784, and it was for an alcoholic beverage establishment limited to a bar lounge or tavern and a dance hall for a two year period. However, they never obtained a dance hall permit. And so in 2011, they removed the dance hall portion of it and just maintained um, the renewal for the alcoholic beverage establishment, which then expired in 2014. So they are seeking to try to get a new SUP for the alcoholic beverage establishment limited to that bar lounge or tavern and the commercial amusement inside use now for live music within the property. Now, the structure hasn't changed, but one thing that I failed to note on part of the uh, discussion here and on the plan is that it states it's 1,874 square feet, but there's also a mezzanine area that has 284 square feet. And so the total square footage is 2,158 square feet. So just to clarify that from the case report. And it does say that in the further description within the analysis of the case report, but it's not on the bullet points on the background section, which was misstated. There's also a covered patio with over 417 square feet, and then an uncovered patio at the rear of the site to the south of 564 square feet. And here's some photos of the site. We're looking south from Elm Street onto the property. And it's this unit right here. See, they have their zoning sign posted within the window. And now we're looking eastward on Elm Street. And from Elm Street south onto the site and the whole plaza, once again, the connected set of buildings that were developed over several decades and west on Elm Street. And now we're looking across Elm Street from the site to the north. Here is the um, site plan. This is the site plan that they previously used. Here I did highlight that it does have that mezzanine area that I didn't specify on that background section. So that's what increases the total area shows you here the covered patio and then the uncovered patio section to the south and their proposed conditions again I've highlighted where it shows that total square footage including the mezzanine area and then the covered patio and the uncovered patio are all stated within the floor area they are also um, limiting the hours of operation here as you see for the two uses between 4 p.m. and 2 a.m. Monday through Friday and 12 p.m. and 2 a.m. Saturday and Sunday. And they have also prohibited the use of outdoor speakers. Staff recommendation is approval for the three-year period subject to the site plan and the conditions as corrected or briefed right now. Questions, commissioners? Seeing and hearing none, thank you, Ms. Munoz. Uh, let's get one more case in before our lunch break. Uh, case number nine, Mr. Pepe. Can you hear me all right? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. This is item. This is case number Z212262. It's an application for the renewal of an and amendment to a specific use permit 505 for a private school on property zone plan development district 173, tract F on the north line of Frankfurt Road, northeast of the intersection of Frankfurt and Hillcrest. So where the property is located in District 12. Here is the grounds of the school as it's built out right now. 
with a play area in front of the school and then the school in the center of the site and a portable building behind the permanent building. So to the northeast, um, also within PD 173 is single family. To the south, there's more single family. And directly to the west are a couple retail sites. And then there's park and greenbelt to the northwest. So it is currently built out as a as Torah Day School. Um, and they're proposing to renew the existing SUP for private school and also amend the site planning conditions to allow additional classroom space in a new building located in the northwest of the site. They propose a, per a new permanent uh, 12,500 square foot building uh, to increase the classroom count from 47 to 49. And the proposed use is only allowable in the district at this time with a SUP. So here is the existing site plan. So it does reflect the property as it exists right now. And here is the amended site plan. So that has space for the additional building in the Northwest along the Northwest border of the property and the existing school. And then the, the table is amended to reflect the increase in two classrooms. Here's the existing landscape plan. Um, generally it reflects the site as it is now. Um, and then there's the proposed landscape plan um, with the small changes highlighted on there, which is the removal of a, a three Bradford pear trees. Um, but otherwise it, it, it remains the same um, and does include more site trees than are required by Article 10. And here is our site as it currently exists from the front from uh, Frankfurt Road. And that's looking into the entrance of the queue for the property. And this is the portal building that's behind the permanent school. And then that's the site where the new facility would be built at the back, back, uh, back northwest of the site. And then this is on site looking at the retail that's just to the west. And then this is kind of the entrance to the queue, uh, not the, the queue necessarily, but the uh, the driveway easement that exists from uh, Hillcrest Road. And then that's looking back across Hillcrest at the exit to that driveway. And then that's back on property looking down that driveway. So the proposed conditions include the following uh, changes. So they're requesting five additional uh, years of, of regular approval and then 10 years of automatic renewal after that point. And they're only incre increasing the classroom count from 47 to 49. Um, they had an enrollment condition. We suggested removing that uh, as well as in hours of operations for special events. Um, their uh, potential enforceability um, issues there that would be difficult to enforce. Um, so we did recommend them striking that and they agreed. Uh, they've maintained these conditions um, for similar reasons. We suggested the removal of those private school activity definitions, which are, um, again, an enforceability issue um, and not necessarily concerned with land use. But they are adding a longer uh, section uh, for the traffic management plan, which includes the continual traffic study submission, um, which includes the biannual uh, traffic study, uh, which was not present before this point, and the, and the common conditions there. So the staff recommendation is a five-year period with eligibility for automatic renewal for additional 10-year periods, subject to a site plan, landscape plan, traffic management plan, and conditions. Commissioners, questions? questions for staff. I have Commissioner some. Standard. Uh, yes. Uh, first, I'm going to ask a question that's kind of a statement, but at any rate. Uh, initially, when the Torah School was started, it was done, which I think is wonderful, as a repurposed food line grocery store. Is that correct, Mr. Pepe? It appears, uh, it appears like an old grocery building. Yes. 
which I think is wonderful that you can take a grocery store and repurpose it that way. Now, going to the new 12,500 building, because it's interesting, it says that the classroom is only going from 47 to 49. Can you explain how is 12,500 only goes to two more classrooms? Yeah, I think there's a number of, of things that might um, lead to that. They might be expanding the size of their classrooms to be more spacious, less cramped. Um, they might just be reshuffling the, the types of and sizes of classrooms. Um, I'm, I'm not positive if they wanted to remove the modular building down the road, but that would give them the ability, they, they might have the ability to remove the modular building to put um, students into permanent classroom space rather than modular. Um, so those generally, uh, hopefully would, you know, could make for less, less cramped classrooms and they'd, they'd spread them out among the two buildings a little better potentially, but they they wouldn't be able to do more than the 49. Okay, and just my last question is only because uh, that you have taken into account what the new lighting's going to be and how it affects around there, how this new building and all the other aspects when you add something to, of a school nature. I mean, does that follow their original plan, the lighting or the outdoor yeah. speakers, all of those kind of things, issues? The only... Um... The only lighting um, that's shown on the plan is is in the middle of their play area, which is remaining in the same place. They're not adding any kind of outdoor play area aside from what they've got. Um, and that's the only one with a light that exists. So you can see that on both of these plans here. Um, but that's going to remain in place, and that is more oriented towards the front of the property. Um, so it's removed from those neighborhoods, but otherwise they're not adding additional um, play areas of any kind. So that wasn't uh, considered a concern. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Other questions for staff? I have some. Uh, uh, Commissioner Carpenter. Uh, yes, Mr. Pepe. Um, the school is adding two classrooms and adding a building in excess of 12,000 square feet, but the parking requirement is actually going down from 163 to 138. And the way they're accomplishing that is they seem to be fundamentally, is it, am I correct in that they're fundamentally changing the nature of their school, that they're moving away from more middle school? They're reducing middle school and high school classrooms to accommodate about a 50% increase in preschool, and that's what's driving the lower demand for parking is that right you got it um generally i yeah they they move a little bit towards the younger grades and as you know the younger grades have a lower parking requirement and that's that's accurate thank you i have one additional question uh, about the staff recommendation for auto renewal for 10-year periods which pretty much puts a school on a pathway for you know per perpetual renewal without having to you know touch base uh, through this process again uh, my concern about that is the ballot that we got in opposition objecting to the noise of late night events or you know after hour events at this location have you um, received any input from neighbors uh, with that concern um, outside of ballot? outside of the ballot you're talking about I haven't heard any um, similar I have not heard any similar complaints all right thank you any further questions? All right, thank you, Mr. Pepe. Uh, at this point, we will take our lunch break, uh, after which we'll continue with cases number four and 10, and the signs and the thoroughfare plan amendment. We'll have a hard stop at 1255. So please try and be back by 1220 if you can. I apologize for the shortness of the lunch period, but I want to keep us on track. Thank you. We're in recess until 1220. It is 1231 p.m. We're back on the record. Uh, we'll continue with the last item to be brief, which is item number four. Ms. Algaier.
Is she remote? So, okay, we can see your presentation. We can't hear you yet. everyone hear me now we can it's a little faint but we can we can hear you okay I apologize I'm I'm doing phone video and earbuds and trying to make it work so I appreciate your bearing with me on that okay this is uh, Z212193 it is <laughs> an application for an amendment to plan development district number 824 uh, for Brian Adams High School, located on the northwest corner of Lingo Lane and Milmar Drive, pro approximately 24.8 acres. Ms. Elgar, we've lost your yes. presentation. Let's try this again. While you do that, uh, let the record reflect that uh, Vice Chair Rubin is online and joined us. Good afternoon. Okay, can, can we see and hear? Uh, yes, we can, thank you. Excellent. Okay, this is Z212193, um, an application for an amendment. That's uh, Plan Development District Number 824, Brian Adams High School. Property is located on the northwest corner of Lingo Lane and Milmar Drive, uh, approximately 24.803 acres. It's located in District 9. The aerial map, uh, the site is essentially surrounded on all sides by single family, except for a right here across Lingo Lane at the corner of Milmar and Lingo, there is currently a surface parking lot that I understand from the developer uh, will be turned into single family use as well. Zoning map, uh, behind that surface parking lot, there is a church, but everything is zoned R75A. And as I said, single family development. Uh, current development is the high school that has been at the location for uh, about 55 years, since 1957. The zoning was changed from R75A to PD 824 in May of 2010. Um, and then it was amended in 2020 to authorize uh, the 80,000 square foot addition for the fine arts building and competition gym, storm shelter, and then also about 30,000 square feet for future expansion of the school. The purpose of the current request um, is to um, codify some things that were shown on the previously approved development plans, but were in conflict with the text of the ordinance. Um, they're also uh, relocating one batting cage that was previously approved, adding another one, uh, modifying some development standards for a detached premise sign, um, cleaning up some ordinance language for fences, um, property line correction, uh, and there is uh, an update to uh, the TMP Exhibit 824B um, and some amendment to the language regarding traffic studies um, that is actually not in the case report, um, but I will brief that information and uh, distribute it 
if needed. Can everyone hear me? I'm hearing noise. Okay. Uh, proposed PD conditions. This is uh, clarification. Clarification of the setback at PV Road where the new batting cage is going in by the baseball field. Clarifying that the, the setback there is 15 feet, the same as on the opposite at Lingo Lane. Uh, modifying, as I said, development standards for a detached premise sign. Uh, this is, uh, essentially allows a larger surface area, larger surface area and taller sign to be located at a uh, minimum setback of six feet. And then here is the additional text that is not in the case report. The applicant has agreed to this additional language, um, adding that if the required traffic studies and updates to those traffic studies are not submitted according to the deadlines in the ordinance, that the director will notify CPC. Uh, additional provision for fences. Uh, the fence locations on site were shown on the previously approved development plan. Um, but they did not comply with the underlying development code, so we're adding language to the text of this ordinance to allow that those offenses can be shown in or can be in the visibility triangles. Site photos starting from uh, the edge of the property on PV adjacent to a creek at the back of the property. This is the back area where construction has been ongoing. Uh, one of the new batting cages uh, was already in progress. I think there was an issue where it, it was shown on a permitting plan and it got started getting built uh, prior to the, uh, the zoning case getting completed, but uh, they stopped construction. Everything's on track awaiting your decision. Looking along PV from Milmar, again, the new batting cage in the background and the parking area. This is uh, where the new, there is a new fire lane um, and access point near some of the construction or the, the additional improvements that were approved under the 2020 amendment. Uh, the portables that you see in, on the photo to the left um, have been removed from the site, so they're no longer blocking parking. Um, they were just there on a temporary basis over the summer. Working our way around to the front of the school, this is the new front entrance, and then working our way around the existing portion of the building, Milmar to Lingo. Uh, there are a couple portables that will stay on site. Um, there is an, uh, a youth and family center portable that's going to remain. It's an accessory to the, the school use per the SUP, I'm sorry, per the PD. This is one of the areas um, that is getting corrected with the current zoning case. So the fence that you see here will be re relocated out of uh, the right-of-way dedication area at the corner and property lines are being corrected to show where that should be located. Um, there was a great deal of construction going on that I understand has now been completed. And surrounding uses, um, at the back of the property on the west side of the creek, um, there is a cul-de-sac on Blake Avenue um, with single family homes that back up to that creek. And then all around, as I said, single family, except for at Lingo Lane and Milmar, there is that surface parking lot. There's also a single family shared access um, across Milmar at PV. and then some undeveloped area between the creek and the adjacent single family on PV. The original development plan is shown in the case report, but just showing it here, uh, these portables are now gone and this is the area where the, the additions came in in 2020. The existing development plan showing the uh, batting cage that was previously approved at the softball field that's now being relocated. 
and the sign also is shown, and that is the sign that's getting the new ordinance language. And the proposed development plan, relocation of batting cage, new batting cage by baseball field, and the sign. Uh, there is an existing traffic management plan uh, shown on the screen here. This is uh, what is being updated. Exhibit 824B will be uh, revised under the current zoning case. Um, also let you know that the traffic management plan that is shown in the docket um, is being revised. And I think that that document um, should have been distributed to commissioners um, earlier today. Staff recommendation is approval subject to a development plan. Uh, a, a, a revised traffic management plan and conditions as a brief. Thank you very much. Questions? Any questions on this item, commissioners? <clears throat> I can't see our folks online, so if there's any questions online, please speak up. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Uh Commissioner, does that you. bring, thank you. That brings our briefing to a close at uh, 12.43 p.m. Let's go ahead and uh, begin our hearing. Ms. Williams, can you please start us off with a roll call?